to all those who are in need of God's blessings, and that we should speedily be able to hear good tidings and feel God's blessing upon us in restoring them speedily to us to benefit freedom. For a moment. Yeah. Chaim, your, your uh, microphone uh, setting is not perfect. Isn't, it's not set for anything. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. Is it better when it's nearer to me? Yeah, this is better, yes. Okay, okay. So I, 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 I try to not keep it too near me because then the clicking on the keyboard may affect things, but I, I'll, I'll try to not peck too hard. Okay, I rather understand you instead of uh, guessing. I appreciate that. Thank you very much for letting me know. Okay. Okay, so let's. Okay, let's begin. Okay. The subject of today's discussion, on the one hand, is a continuation of what has been the focus of our attention for the last couple of sessions, and that is prophecies on Messiah. On the other hand, there is a very specific focus in our discussion today, and that is an especially fraught passage in the Bible. Isaiah chapter 53. So it is on that note that we bark upon today's questions. The first is relatively straightforward and simple. The second, as we shall see, is considerably more complex. So without any further delay. Prophecies on the Messiah part three and Isaiah chapter 53. The question. Is it true that Jews never read Isaiah chapter 53 in synagogues? If not, why not? What prophecies are read in synagogues and when? A very intriguing question. The short answer to the first component, is it true that Jews never read Isaiah chapter 53 in synagogues as a public reading in the synagogue? Yes, it is. Please allow me to explain. Why not? Because the truth is that over the course of the year, while there are a considerable number of readings from Isaiah, in the synagogue we read roughly around a quarter of Isaiah. That is, while in synagogue services on Shabbat, on the Sabbath, we do read from the Torah, the five books of Moses, and from the prophets, there is a significant difference between these two readings in that, as undoubtedly everyone is aware, the five books of Moses, the Torah, is read in completion. Our practice is to complete the cycle of the Torah every year. We begin and end the cycle on Simchat Torah, the day of rejoicing with the Torah, which is the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. So to that extent, then, the entire Torah is read. As for the prophets, the readings from the prophets are selected on a week-by-week, Sabbath-by-Sabbath, and holiday basis based upon motifs, themes. Generally speaking, for the most part, the selection from the prophets is based upon some thematic similarity, some common motif with the reading from the Torah that week. At times, what principally informs the choice of the selection is not the reading from the Torah, but the time of year, the holy days, certain specific red letter dates in the calendar, 
that are the basis for particular readings from the prophets. But there isn't any cycle of going through all the prophets. Now, if you ask, what was the basis altogether for this reading from the prophets? The answer is, we really don't have any unambiguous direct information. The earliest source that explains the practice is from considerably after the practice arose. It is a medieval source that presents the tradition that there was a period, presumably during the Hellenistic period, during the persecutions under Antiochus that were the cause of the Hasmonean revolt, when reading the Torah was forbidden. And as a result, since evidently there wasn't the same concern with respect to reading from the prophets, a reading from the prophets was substituted, and it was chosen in order to maintain some kind of thematic consistency with what would have been read in the Torah, and when the decree was annulled, the practice of reading from the prophets persisted. It's interesting to note that one of the earliest written sources that explicitly speaks of reading from the Torah and the prophets on Shabbat, on the Sabbath, is from Christian scriptures. In Acts Chapter 13, verse 15, when Paul was invited to deliver a sermon following the reading from the Torah and the reading from the prophets. And indeed, in many communities, that is to this day the choice time at which the rabbi or the leader of the community is called upon to deliver a sermon. But again, While the practice of reading from the prophets is clearly an ancient one, it was not to complete all of the prophets. Of the various books of the prophets, the only ones that are read completely are Ovadia, which is just one chapter long, and Yonah, Jonah, which is just four chapters long. Well, since Ovadia, There's only one chapter, that's just one reading. And the book of Yonah is read in its entirety, given that the theme is repentance, on the afternoon of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. But otherwise, none of the books of the prophets are read in their entirety. Isaiah is actually better represented than any of the other books of the prophets, and roughly, on average, around one-third of the readings from the prophets are from the book of Isaiah. Well, it is, after all, the largest book in the prophets. But again, I'm going to reiterate that that still amounts to reading only around a quarter of Isaiah in the public readings in the synagogue. Obviously, that doesn't bear at all on our study of the words of the prophets. We study all the words of the Bible, and as we have already noted, On many occasions, we regard all of the Bible as inspired by God, and to that extent, it will always remain not only the focus of our study, but the focus of our lives and the guidance for how to lead our lives. But again, Isaiah chapter 53 is not part of the public readings. At the same time, as I just noted, certainly is a focus of study. And hence, we move on without any further delay to the second question. If you believe in the words of Isaiah, what do you believe Isaiah chapter 53 is teaching us? Who is God's suffering servant? And what is God's mission and purpose for him? So, of course that we believe in the words of Isaiah, that we regard all of the words of Isaiah as the words of a true prophet who 
got his messages from God is something that goes without saying. The challenge, of course, is to understand what those words mean. And in particular, in the context of Isaiah chapter 53, of course, to identify God's suffering servant. So without any further ado, let's embark upon our quest to answer precisely that question. Before we get to the specifics of Isaiah chapter 53, however, in resolving who God's suffering servant is, we have a more basic mission, the foundation of this quest, and that is to determine who altogether God's servant is in the book of Isaiah. And this inevitably leads us into a fascinating survey. That is, in focusing upon Isaiah chapter 53, as we have already noted on many occasions, we need to overcome the artificial boundary lines drawn by chapters beginning and ending. That is, the subject of the serving servant of Isaiah begins in Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13, where we read in the English translation, Behold, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. My servant, translating the Hebrew, of thee. And the continuation, According as many were appalled at you, so marred was his visage, unlike that of a man, and his form, unlike that of the sons of men, so shall he cast down many nations. Kings will shut their mouths because of him, for that which had not been told them they saw, and that which they had not heard they perceived. And what follows is a portrayal of what they say. Without delving into the details, because it's not germane at the moment, we continue after what they say in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10. Yet God desired to crush him, the servant, by disease, to see if his soul would offer itself in restitution, that he might see his seed prolong his days, and that the purpose of God might prosper by his hand. Of the travail of his soul, he shall see to the full, even again, my servant, the Hebrew, Avadi, who by his knowledge did justify the righteous one to the many, and their iniquities he did bear. Therefore will I divide him a portion in public, and he shall divide the spoil with the mighty, because he bared his soul at the death, as was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Now, I should note at the outset, an exhaustive discussion of Isaiah chapter 53 will inevitably need to await the appropriate session in our series on Isaiah, the visions of Isaiah, which will be an appropriate opportunity to discuss all of the motifs of the chapter, chapters, again, beginning in chapter 52. The focus of our attention at present, given this extraordinary description of whoever the servant is, is when Isaiah uses the expression, again in translation, my servant, in the Hebrew, avadi. To whom is he referring? Obviously, my servant is the prophet speaking, as it were, on behalf of God in the book of Isaiah. 
who does God mean in saying my servant? So it is on that note then that we need to do a survey. And within the limits of time that we have, I'm going to try to make it as exhaustive a survey as possible in all of Isaiah, who is labeled my servant by God? And the answer isn't so simple, because we certainly have a number of instances in which my servant is identified explicitly. And the first of them is Isaiah chapter 20, verse 3. My servant, Isaiah. Again, the Hebrew, Abdi, Abdi Yeshayahu. So in the first instance in which the word Abdi, my servant, appears in Isaiah, it has a, an explicit address, and the explicit address is the prophet himself. We move on, without any further ado, to the second place where we encounter Abdi, my servant, and that is in Isaiah chapter 37, verse 35. The context here is after the blasphemous pretensions of the son Cheriv, of Sennacherib, emperor of Assyria, the righteous king Hezekiah, Hezekiah. Praise to God. And God sends the prophet Isaiah to assure him that his prayers have been heard and are being answered. So the city will indeed be saved. In verse 33, see the context. Therefore, thus says God concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come unto this city. Of course, the city is this one, Jerusalem. Nor shoot an arrow there, neither shall he come before it with shield, nor cast the mound against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and he shall not come unto the city, says God. For I will defend this city to save it, for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. So there we have it. The second place that of thee, my servant, appears in Isaiah, it also has an explicit address. It refers to King David. After these first two references to Avdi, my servant, we find a number of explicit references to my servant in Isaiah that also have an explicit reference. The first of them is here in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 8. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham who loved me. In verse 9, you whom I have taken hold of from the ends of the earth and called you from the uttermost parts thereof, or alternatively, from its nobles, and said unto you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you away. So clearly, in Isaiah chapter 41, Again, both verses 8 and 9, we see explicit reference to God's servant, and it refers to Jacob, to Israel. And similarly, when we consider Isaiah chapter 43, the reference to my servant is in verse 10. You are my witnesses, says God, and my servant, whom I have chosen that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he before me, there was no God for me, neither shall there be any after me. You are my witnesses and my servant. Who is you? The answer becomes clear when we consider the beginning of the chapter. In verse 1, But now thus says God who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name, you are mine. And as much as the entire chapter continues this statement to Jacob, Israel, then clearly in verse 10, 
you are my witnesses, is likewise addressed to Jacob and Israel. Once again, just as we saw in Isaiah chapter 41. And once again, in Isaiah chapter 44. Yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. In verse 2, thus says God who made you and formed you from the womb, who will help you, fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and you, Yeshurun, whom I have chosen. So, of course, again, in Isaiah chapter 44, my servant is explicitly identified, Jacob. Israel, whom I have chosen. And similarly, in verse 21, the same theme repeats, remember these things, O Jacob and Israel, for you are my servant. I have formed you, you are my own servant, O Israel, you should not forget me. Our next example in Isaiah chapter 45, the opening verse of chapter 45 is, of course, significant in that God refers to his Mashiach, in simple English translation, that means his anointed, as Cyrus, that Cyrus is God's anointed one, obviously, again, for the purpose that God has designated him, as we discussed in the past. What's germane for our purposes, of course, in considering the theme of my servant, is verse 4, for the sake of Jacob, my servant, and Israel, my chosen. I have called you by your name. I have surnamed you, though you have not known me. Referring, of course, to the mission that God has placed upon Cyrus, even unbeknown to him. But once again, the identification of the servant is clear. The identification of the servant is Jacob, Israel. And finally, in Isaiah chapter 48, once again, we encounter reference to the servant. It is not using avdi, it is rather speaking in the third person, avdo, God's servant, God has redeemed his servant, Jacob. And of course, again, the reference to Jacob, to Israel, as the object of the prophecy is explicit in verse 17 as well. Thus says God, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. So in all these instances, that is, beginning in chapter 41, terminating here in chapter 48, we have encountered repeated references to God's servant. And in all these instances, the references were clear. Jacob, Israel. Except, I have skipped a couple of additional references. And here's where matters really get interesting. The first place, which I had skipped in our progression through the book of Isaiah, but to which we now need to return, is Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah chapter 42 begins, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights, or whom my soul desires. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall make justice to go forth to the nations. And verse 2, he shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard outside. Verse 3, a bruised reed shall he not break, and a dimly burning wick shall he not quench. He shall make justice to go forth according to the truth. He shall not weaken, nor be crushed, till he has set justice in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his teaching. Who is it? Who is this servant of God? Now, on the one hand, we do note that in both the chapter that preceded this and the chapter that followed it, in chapters 41, 43, and elsewhere as well, the recurrent theme was Jacob, my servant, and Israel, 
whom I have chosen. Well, verse 1, behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights, or whom my soul desires. So to that extent, one possibility would of course be to say that this refers likewise, as my servant was explicitly identified in the previous chapter, and my servant was explicitly identified in the following chapter, to Israel, which is certainly a cogent way of understanding the chapter. And if you ask how in Jewish tradition is this chapter understood, well, that is certainly one possibility. But there's another possibility, a possibility with which you may be very well acquainted from other sources, and that is that perhaps chapter 42 is speaking about the Messiah. I feel obliged to note here that I am, of course, fully aware that Christians understand Isaiah chapter 42 as referring to the Messiah. This is an idea that is articulated in ancient Jewish traditions as well. Obviously, the identity of the Messiah in Jewish traditions is unstated and is, as I'm sure I need not to point down to any of you, not Jesus, because Jews never recognized the status of Jesus as a Messiah. But I do sense that in at least the overwhelming majority, and very possibly all instances in which Christians have seen in passages of the Hebrew Bible a reference to the Messiah, they were simply echoing an ancient Jewish tradition of which, of course, they were aware. That is, the founders of Christianity were certainly aware because the founders of Christianity were all Jews. And steeped with Jewish scholarship, they were familiar with the interpretation of, for example, Isaiah chapter 42 as referring to the Messiah. So there is that possibility as well. We could understand Isaiah chapter 42 as referring to the Messiah. This does have undoubtedly implications with respect to how we understand verse 6. I, God, have called you in righteousness and have taken hold of your hand and kept you and set you for covenant of the people for light of the nations. Is it referring to Israel, the nation, or is it referring to that scion of Israel, the king of Israel, the Messiah? Both possibilities are cogent. Simultaneously, in considering why this chapter is so ambiguous, while admittedly the first part of the chapter in speaking of God's mission is very amenable to understanding as an allusion to the Messiah, it's only the first part of the chapter. When we continue in Isaiah chapter 42, from verse 18, we encounter stern words of rebuke. In verse 18, hear you, deaf, and look, you blind, to see. In verse 19, the appropriate translation here is subject to different interpretations, but it doesn't make that much of a difference for the point that we're making. One possibility, who is blind but my servant or deaf as my messenger that I send? Who is blind as he that is wholehearted and blind as God's servant? The alternative translation, who is blind but my servant or deaf as my messenger that I send? He who was blind 
is as one who received his payment, and he who is blind is as a servant of God. In either case, these are strong words of rebuke, specifically for the one who was identified as my servant. Abdi, described as blind, yes. In the continuation, seeing many things you observe not, opening the ears, he hears not. God desired for his righteousness in that sake to make the Torah great and glorious, but in verse 22, this is a people robbed and spoiled either. They are all of them stared in holes, or all their youths are grieved, and they're hidden prison houses. They are for a prey, and none delivers, for spoil, and none says restore. Who among you will give ear to this? Who will hearken and hear for the time to come? Who gave Jacob for spoil and Israel to the robbers? Did not God? He against whom we have sinned, and in whose ways they would not walk. Neither did they hearken to his Torah. Therefore, he poured upon him the fury of his anger and the strength of battle, and it set him on fire round about, yet he knew not, and it burned him, yet he laid it not to heart. These scathing words of rebuke, I repeat, are addressed to God's servant. I recall some time ago, I noted the tension between the beginning of Isaiah chapter 42 and the end of the chapter. And one of the participants in the talk noted that in her Bible, where we encounter my servant in verse 1, servant was capitalized, whereas in verse 19, servant was not capitalized, which is a nice way of distinguishing between the two, but as undoubtedly all the Hebrew experts are well aware, there are no capital letters in Hebrew. The Hebrew of D is identical in both instances. And obviously, given these words of rebuke, understanding Isaiah chapter 42 as a reference to the Messiah is difficult. If anything, I would have to say that what seems to me the most incredible way of conjoining the two parts of the chapter is to understand the entire chapter as rebuke. The first part of the chapter in describing the mission is also part of the review because essentially the thrust of that opening part of the chapter, behold my, my servant whom I uphold, is presenting what the mission was to have been. What you were called upon to do, the summons was indeed, I set you for a covenant of the people, for a light of the nations. Israel, what are you doing? What happened to my servant? Who is blind but my servant? Why aren't you fulfilling the mission that I bestowed upon you, with which I charged you? So both possibilities exist in the end. And if, now that we're, for now, completing our discussion of chapter 42, we will return to it, God willing, in Isaiah. If you expect me to say, but given the weight of the evidence, the final conclusion in Jewish tradition is Isaiah chapter 42 is speaking to... We have both possibilities. There is no one single right answer. That's why 
Isaiah chapter 42 is on our list of the three ambiguous passages with respect to my servant. Now, continuing, the second ambiguous passage is Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah chapter 49 begins with a call really to all the world. Hearken, O isles, unto me. Listen, you peoples from afar. God has called me from the womb, from the bowels of my mother. He has made mention of my name. And he made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. And he made me a polished arrow in his quiver. He concealed me. Verse 3. And he said to me, You are my servant. Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Now, given what I stated about chapter 49 being an ambiguous passage, you may be wondering, where's the ambiguity? Here, as we saw from chapter 41 through chapter 48 with the ambiguity of chapter 42, the serpent is explicitly identified. My servant, Israel. Repeatedly, after all, it was Israel, Jacob, which is, of course, the same people. So in chapter 49, verse 3, is it any less explicit that the prophet is speaking of Israel as God's servant? To which my response is, it is less explicit. At the very least, it is certainly more ambiguous because of a particular motif that appears with respect to the expression, my servant, in Isaiah chapter 49, that does not appear in any other reference to my servant in the book of Isaiah. And that is, as we noted, he said unto me, Whoever the servant is, the servant is speaking here in first person. So on the one hand, it could be referring to Israel, and we have ample precedent for understanding the servant as a reference to Israel, as we've already seen. It could also be referring, as we saw, remember, in the first instance, in which my servant appeared in chapter 20, to the prophet Isaiah himself. And besides the first person, what inevitably inclines toward this possibility as well is what we read in verse 6. He said, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the offspring of Israel. I will also give you for light of the nations that my salvation may be unto the end of the earth. So inevitably, there is a problem in understanding my servant as referring to Israel if my servant is sent to restore the offspring of Israel. Simultaneously, one can't help but note that we encountered this expression for a light of the nations explicitly, not only here in chapter 49, verse 6, but also in chapter 42, verse 6. So there is obviously, a certain elegance in understanding both of these charges to be a light of the nations as referring to the same messenger, the same servant, Israel. But the truth is, we don't know here for sure either. Could be referring 
to Israel could be referring to the prophet Isaiah. Inevitably, when we consider the thrust of verse 3, those two possibilities mean either God is addressing himself in verse 3 to Isaiah and calling Isaiah by the name of Israel because, after all, Isaiah comes from Israel. Or, the alternative possibility, that God really, in verse 3, is addressing himself to Israel. But Isaiah, coming from Israel, is the encapsulation, the embodiment of all Israel. And of course, inevitably, it is based upon that, that we'll need to consider who is being sent for light of the nation. As we consider the question in chapter 42, verse 6, is that a charge to all of Israel, or is it a charge to the Messiah coming from Israel? Here in chapter 49, verse 6, is it a charge to all of Israel, or is it a charge to the prophet Isaiah coming from Israel? And of course, again, inevitably, we recognize we don't know for sure. And all of the ensuing verses in Isaiah chapter 49 really can be understood in either of these ways. So once again, if we ask, what is the right answer? How should we interpret Isaiah chapter 49? We don't have one right answer. It could be referring to Israel, it could be referring to the prophet. I feel compelled to share with you in this vein a tradition that we have with respect to this verse. Jeremiah, chapter 23, verse 29. When the prophet Jeremiah, speaking in God's name, says, Is not my word like fire, says God, and like a hammer that shatters a rock? Consider the metaphor here. The hammer that shatters the rock. You don't just have one rock anymore. You have all the slivers of rock. All the little pieces. That's what happens with God's word. It subdivides in our tradition into many, many different ways of looking at the words. How can there be more than one answer? Our response would be, this is God's word. How can there be only one answer? God's word, after all, is inexhaustible. But now, before we continue, let us return to Isaiah chapters 52 and 53. Again, this is the third passage that's ambiguous where we don't have any explicit, clear identity of who God's servant is. Of course, once again, we could note that beginning in chapter 41 and on, in nearly every chapter, with the exception of the ambiguities in chapters 42 and 49, we encounter God's servant as a reference to Israel. So, is my servant in Isaiah chapters 52 and 53 referring to Israel? May very well be referring to Israel. And that is a significant approach that we find in our tradition among the commentaries. I suspect it is the dominant approach as the simple, plain meaning of what Isaiah is stating. But is it the only possible answer? At this point, I suspect you can anticipate my response. It's not the only possible answer. Indeed, we do have ancient traditions understanding Isaiah chapters 52 and 53 as speaking of the Messiah. We also have many scholars who understand Isaiah chapters 52 and 53 as speaking of the prophet Isaiah. So it's interesting that 
Isaiah chapter 42 gave us two principal interpretations that it was referring to Israel and that it was referring to Messiah. Chapter 49 also gave us two interpretations that it was referring to Israel or that it was referring to Isaiah. Well, taking all three of those possibilities, when we turn to chapter 52 and 53, we can understand it as referring to Israel or Isaiah or the Messiah. So which is right? And of course, at this point, I suspect you can anticipate my response. Why can't we regard them all as right? The Bible, as we have noted repeatedly, especially in our last sessions, is here to teach us. To the extent that we learn cogent lessons from the Bible, we can learn many lessons from the Bible. And again, I reiterate the thrust of, Isaiah, of Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 29. Like the hammer that breaks the rock, that shatters the rock into many pieces. There are many possible interpretations that enable us to relate to God's word as what it is. Torah. Teaching. Instruction. Now, that having been stated, I do feel compelled to consider where this would leave us. Because ultimately, again, if we are going to relate to these words as teaching and instruction, we need to consider what is teaching us. What is the instruction? And it is on that plane that inevitably we need to consider why God's servant is suffering. To respond briefly to this question, because I suspect that a more exhaustive response will need to await our fuller treatment of these words in Isaiah, consider what the prophet Amos tells us. At the beginning of chapter 3, hear this word that God has spoken about you, O children of Israel about the whole family that I brought up out of the land of Egypt, saying, verse 2, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will visit upon you all your iniquities. Now, exactly what is meant by you only have I known of all the families of the earth is obviously the material for a much longer discussion. That's not to imply that God is not providentially involved in all the families of the earth. But there is a level of intimacy that is associated with God's chosen people, and the consequence of that is not going to be having an easy time, but just the opposite, suffering. Therefore, I will visit upon you all your iniquities, not necessarily upon everyone else. How do we understand that? We'll need to consider the answer to that question at much greater length. I suspect the next topic that we will be addressing in the question and answer sessions will be the suffering of the innocent. The Odyssey. For our purposes at present, I'll note two additional passages in the Bible. One, Genesis chapter 15. When God says to Abraham, Know of a surety that your seed will be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. Suffering. This is the fate of Israel, the seed of Abraham. And in verse 16 of the chapter we read, and in the fourth generation, they shall come back here to the land of Israel. 
for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet full. Very interesting expression here. The iniquity of the Amorite is not yet full. That is, the Amorite, the Emori, the people who are currently populating the land are depraved and corrupt and they are, we could say, digging their own graves. And God isn't going to stop them because the greatest gift that God gives us all is free will. The iniquity of the Amorite is not yet full. Within four generations, they will have written their death sentence. There will not be for them the relentless suffering that I will visit upon you all your iniquities, such as, again, your seed being afflicted in a land not theirs for years. They'll just continue business as usual until they have earned their destruction. You, where by you, I think we should appreciate this applies to all those who really are essentially striving to rise, to grow spiritually. You will learn suffering by being God's suffering servant. That I'm sorry, is there a problem? Wait, should, I, should I close all the mic? Um, but, but, uh, it wasn't touching me. Is it better? Is this better? I, I'm, I don't know. Um, I wasn't. I wasn't touching it. It's. Uh, So is, it, is this is this better? Better? Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. The problem is it's uh, it's, it's a lot of talent that I don't have. <laughs> I keep my eyes on everything at once. Uh, okay. Um, Okay, so where were we? Um, it's good. Okay, uh, to re return to where we were then. Um, that this is something then that God provides us. Let's, I guess let's start the recording again. So, in a way, then, when we consider the implications of therefore I will visit upon you all your iniquities in a way it's a gift and besides that one additional passage that I think it is germane for us to consider is Ezekiel chapter 20 and while on the one hand I think this should also be understood as a gift. Maybe on the other hand, it's important for us to appreciate the severity of what God says here through the prophet Ezekiel. Chapter 20, verse 32, and that which comes into your mind shall not be at all. In that you say, we will be as the nations, as the families of the earth, to serve wood and stone as I live said God the Lord, surely with a strong hand and with an outstretched arm and with fury poured out will I be king over you. And I will bring you out from the peoples and will gather you out of the lands wherein you are scattered with a strong hand and with an outstretched arm and with fury poured out. 
and I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples, and I will enter into judgment with you face to face. Scary words, but important words when we recognize that we do, after all, have a mission here. God is charging us. And I remind you, of course, in this regard, once again, of the implications in Isaiah chapter 42. I gave you a mission. What are you doing with it? Why are you blind to death? That suffering, then, on the one hand, is a reflection. You are chosen with a mission. And that confers upon you a vitality. A vitality, for example, that the Amorites didn't have. And that's why once the iniquity of the Amorite is full, it's finished. Everyone has free will. But having free will means we have the opportunity to choose life. And unfortunately, we also have the opportunity if we so desire to choose death. Sunday's and servant is ironically always reminded of what his mission is. The suffering servant has that critical role for the world, such that on the one hand, indeed, there is suffering. But on the other hand, what's the conclusion? The conclusion is it had pleased God. God desired to crush him with disease, to see if his soul would offer itself in restitution, that he might see his seed, prolong his days, and critically, the purpose of God might prosper by his hand. Again, of the travail of his soul, he shall seek the full, even my servant who by his knowledge did justify the righteous ones the many and their iniquities he did bear. He justified the righteous one. He introduced God to the world. He bared their iniquities. And through doing so, he fulfilled the destiny. That destiny that perhaps most aptly, as we've noted in the past, is expressed in Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6. I will give you for light of the nations the goal that my salvation may be unto the end of the earth. So again, who is the suffering servant of Isaiah? What's the right answer? At the end of the day, we are still left with multiple right answers. It doesn't have to be one. The most important thing is there are many lessons that we can learn from. Now, having stated that with respect to the thrust of Isaiah chapters 52 and 53, there is admittedly a final issue, and we've already touched upon it in our discussion of Isaiah chapters 7 through 9. Last time, we'll be returning to those chapters in the study of Isaiah in the coming sessions. And that is my additional agenda in stressing what we have just discussed. Because besides, of course, the obvious agenda of trying to understand Isaiah better, as you know, I have a mission. A mission with which I believe God has charged me to build bridges. And in particular in that vein, of course, inevitably, we are all aware that Isaiah chapter 53, not only Isaiah chapter 53, has been a bone of contention between Christians and Jews for at the very least close to a millennium, in particular, 
in the medieval disputations that were generally foisted upon the Jews unwillingly, in which Christian theologians and Jewish theologians disputed the tenets of their respective faiths, and in particular, passages from the Bible. And one of the major themes that we find in these disputations, the Christian theologians opening the Bible and saying, look at this passage, it's in the Hebrew Bible, you believe in it, and it is clearly a proof of the coming of our Messiah, of the mission of Jesus. And the Jewish response typically was no less vehement that the verse has absolutely nothing to do with Christianity or with Jesus, and it doesn't constitute a proof at all. And of course, inevitably, when we recognized that was what was taking place, there wasn't really a dialogue going on. It was more talking past one another. And these passages became such battlegrounds that, as I think I've shared with many of you, I have been asked, do Jews and Christians really read the same Bible? That is, speaking of the Hebrew Bible, it's obviously the same text, but if it's understood so totally differently, is it really the same book? And my response unequivocally is, yes. At the very least, we need to realize we're reading the same Bible. The Bible teaches us, once again, on many levels. Remember, the hammer shatters the rock. There is the plain meaning of the text that is always the foundation. There are various additional layers of meaning that are built beyond that. This is most exquisitely the approach of the ancient form of biblical scholarship in Jewish tradition called Midrash that was never intended to supplant the plain meaning of the text, but rather to supplement the plain meaning of the text with additional layers of meaning. Again, realizing that God's word is always multifaceted. I'm going to reiterate, Midrash never supplants the plain meaning of the text. Here, indeed, we can speak of multiple layers of the plain meaning none of which supplants the others. These are coexistent levels of understanding of the text. And when we consider again, chapters 52 and 53, are they talking about Israel? Are they talking about Isaiah? Are they talking about the Messiah? Yes. Yes. And yes. And they teach us lessons on all of these planes. And no one plane needs to be deemed correct, which of course inevitably will mean, on the one hand, these passages, indeed all of the passages in the Hebrew Bible, can never be summoned as proofs for events that took place hundreds of years later and were never explicitly mentioned in these words of the prophets. The prophets, as we noticed, were speaking first and foremost to their time, but not only to their time. And I say the passages don't constitute proofs. That, of course, doesn't invalidate interpreting them as illusions. That is, after all, what Midrash does. The text alludes to something more than what the text is saying. But once we recognize that they couldn't possibly be construed as proofs, then regarding them as disproven is also no longer relevant. 
and what was a battleground can become very simply a domain in which we agree to disagree agreeably. We're not going to agree. That is, even to the extent that, as I noted, in passages such as Isaiah chapter 53, there was an ancient Jewish tradition that does understand it as referring to the Messiah. Obviously, the Jewish vision of the Messiah is critically different from the Christian vision of the Messiah. No, we're not going to agree. We are, after all, going to remain Jews and Christians, faithful to our traditions, faithful to the respective roots that God has given us, through which to come to Him. But as long as we can agree to disagree, agree with it. As long as we can recognize that neither perspective is disproven, then we're no longer obliged to get into an argument over this. We can simply recognize that we will retain our respective perspectives respectfully. May we indeed integrate the lessons of the Bible. The lessons that come from the plain into the text, and the lessons that come from additional layers of meaning. And may we do so, each one of us, as means to fulfilling the missions that God gives each of us in our paths coming to Him and His blessings. God bless you.